Last week, Jesus began to teach us on prayer. So I, I said last week, Jesus is going to teach us the attitude that we are to come to Him in prayer with. And then today, I'm going to tell you how to get out of God what you want. What are you laughing at? Don't make me come back there. I'm telling you, today, we're going to find out how to get out of God what you want. The question is, what do you really want? I know what I really want, right? I, and I was thinking about it this week, and there are times when I am certain that what I want it seems like God and everybody else in my life is trying to keep me from getting it, right? You ever been there? It reminded me of a, of a kid named Ralphie who wanted a Red Ryder carbine action 200-shot range model air rifle. And Connor actually knew that from memory. <laughs> and I thought about Ralphie, and I thought about him, and when get I don't, if you watch the Christmas story, it turns out that some people had really horrible parents. I found some in the Saturday service that didn't make their kids watch a Christmas story. It is the best Christmas movie ever. And so if you haven't seen it, you need to. But there's a scene where Ralphie decides that he knows how he's going to get what he wants for Christmas, and he goes there to get it. Come on, kid. Oh! Christmas, little boy. <laughs> My mind had gone blank. Frantically, I tried to remember what it was I wanted. I was blowing it, blowing it. Come on, kid. How about a nice uh, football? 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 What's a football? <laughs> With unconscious will, my voice squeaked out. Football. Okay, get him out of here. A football? Oh, no. Okay, what was I doing? Wake up, is... stupid. Wake up. No. <laughs> Out, kid. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Sometimes I'm pretty sure I feel God looking at me and putting his boot in my face. I'm like, you don't understand. I really, really want it. And I promise not to shoot my eye out. We're working through the gospel according to Luke. We've been in Luke since November last year. Uh, we're in chapter 11 today. Uh, we're going to be in here for a while. But we love this. We take, we take one story at a time. We talk about the, the background and the history behind it, the stuff that everyone knew when he wrote it. And it, it turns into kind of this three-dimensional story then. So the, the words start to leap off the page for us. Last week, Jesus taught us to pray, and, uh, and as he did this, uh, we decided that if, if, if you've ever memorized this before, if you've been around church at all, we've all read it out of the book of Matthew. So even though we're working through, uh, through the, the book of uh, Luke, we're going to read it out of Matthew together, and we'll pray this together, if you will, here in a moment. Uh, Jesus is a rabbi. He is a teacher of the 613 laws of Moses, and he has disciples. As he is a teacher, he teaches everybody, but the disciples are specific types of students. They're the people who want to also be rabbis themselves. So when they follow a rabbi, they want to know how he does everything that he does, and they want to be able to teach everything that the rabbi teaches. They want to do it the way that the rabbi does it. And so when Jesus is praying, his disciples say, Jesus, you should also teach us to pray. Will you read this and pray this with me right now, if you will? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. A beautiful prayer that sometimes we don't really have a clue what it actually means. So last week when we broke it down, this is what we said. It said, I will show God's name to be holy when I call myself a follower of Jesus. I also need to do what he says because I am the reflection of him. And if I am not striving to live a holy life, the life that he has called me to, then when I call myself after him, it's like I'm cursing God, but I'm not doing what he said. But I will make sure his name is considered holy. Uh, I will bring his kingdom here by doing his will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, who's supposed to do that? Yeah. You, me, and everyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus, we're supposed to actually do His will here, just like we will do when we get to heaven and we see Him face to face and we feel like we don't have any other choice. So, <laughs> you don't have any other choice here on earth. You should do what God says to do here on earth. I will trust God even for my daily stuff. You know, I'm good at trusting God for, for my eternity, because I can't provide that for myself, but I kind of feel like, well, I've got this, right? I've got today. God, you just handle all the rest of it. No, I need to learn to trust Him so much that I even trust Him for what I need today. I follow Him, I do what He says, and trust that He's going to take care of it. That's, that's a lot farther than I'm comfortable with, but that's what God teaches me to pray. And then the worst news in the entire New Testament... We are to pray that God will forgive us in the same way we forgive other people. That God will use the ruler that we use against other people, that God would use it for us. Thankfully, God doesn't do that, but that's what He taught us to pray, so that we will learn to forgive other people the way that we want to be forgiven. And we pray that God will please protect me from the evil one. When we do all of that, it really doesn't seem like I'm going to be that close to the evil one, right? When we get all the rest of it done. But when we pray, we pray in sharp contrast, contrast to that. I don't know about you, but I'm really, I mean, you guys seem really nice. But a lot of the people in the 9 a.m. service, the way that they pray is, God, I'm on my way to get my favorite cookies at the gates of hell because they have great cookies. But while I am there, I pray that you would protect me. Anybody ever done that? And I promise, if you get me out of this, I'm totally going to do what you say. Right? Completely backwards, right? I, literally, I had my, the, first, the first pastor I, I ever worked for <laughs> said, hey, how'd you get into this? And he goes, well, I was a scout in Vietnam, and I got shot down in my helicopter, and I was carrying my pilot out. And I said, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll be a pastor. True story. <laughs> no, not the right way to go about it, okay? We need to put ourselves under God's authority, and then we begin to pray. And that's where the blessings come. Once we are under God's authority, then God can move on our behalf. If we're not under His authority, the first thing He needs to do is to move us, right? He can't move in our lives. He needs to move us under His authority first because that's the important stuff. We're going to find out what's important. Now, last week when we began to talk about prayer, we also talked about uh, uh, prayers that come from you know, uh, books of common prayer and prayers that are in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. And uh, so on, uh, on your East Avenue app, um, the East Ave Church app, if, uh, if you have that, you got this week a notification that, that we actually put a new page on there for our common prayers. Uh, we put uh, the, the Lord's Prayer on there and then a Disciple's Prayer that is kind of a more modern version of that and also some other things on there. And if you didn't get a notification, you're probably like my wife this week <clears throat> because I literally I'm sitting there with my wife uh, and, and I, I said, hey, did, did you see 
you see the, the new app, the, you know, the, the new stuff on the app? And she goes, no, nah, I didn't see that. Well, you, you got the notification, right? Well, I, I didn't get the notification. Are you serious? My wife even turned off the notifications for the app? I'm not going to annoy you. It's going to be okay. And she goes, well, no, I, I, don't, I don't think I did that. I said, really? She goes, yeah, I don't even know how to do that. So I said, well, here, hand me, hand me your phone. So I got her phone, and I'm looking through it, and then I, I start searching. I said, you don't, you don't even have the app on your phone. She goes, yes, yes, I do. It's not here. I tell you all the time. Why isn't that? Well, it's probably on my iPad. I said, but you all have it, right? Yes. <laughs> so look on there. If you don't ever know what to pray and you're just thinking, maybe I should pray today, you can go on there and look, and uh, we'll start sticking some prayers on there, and you can pray those, and you can pray those with your, uh, with your, uh, with your fellow church people. So there is power in prayer that, uh, that maybe you have been missing, and we're going to talk about how we get what we want out of God. But the thing is this, what I know about God is that He is the highest authority in the entire universe. And so when I hear people say, let me teach you how to pray so that God has to do what you want Him to do, I go, there's something wrong here, right? Because God does what He wants to do, right? Nobody tells God what to do. I don't tell God what to do. Today, we're going to learn how to pray in in order to find ourselves in a place where where God can, can, can give us the desires of our heart. But I don't... I don't have a special way that I pray in order to get that. I know that may seem like the right way to pray is to pray in, in Old English, you know, in, in God's original language, you know. Oh, thou art Father, we beseech thee to bring us today. You're, it's like, no, you don't have to do that, and you don't have to, you don't have to pray like Yoda. Um, God wants to hear from your heart, and it doesn't matter how you do that. Okay? God's not going to correct your English. So after Jesus teaches us his prayer, then he's, uh, this is uh, from Luke chapter 11, starting with verse 5. Then he says this about prayer. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend. I know for some of you that's a stretch, but let's pretend. And you go to him at midnight and say, friend. Lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. Anybody ever shown up at midnight at your house? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Hospitality was a really big deal 2,000 years ago, especially in the Middle East, because your village was only known by their reputation. And so it's not like they can just put out a... uh, you know, hey, let's create a website to tell people about us, right? They're only known by the people that come through and what they say about you. And so it's important to them that, that every, every time a new visitor comes into town, so if I came into your village and I, I would come in and I'd sit in the city center and I would wait there until you came and saw me there. And because you want your village to be known as hospitable, you would come up to me and go, Hey, you look new in town. I'd say, yeah. What I would say is, I'm heading to the next town. And you'd say, oh, that's a long way from here. I think you should come to my house and stay with us. My wife would love it. Right? Visitors, she didn't know it was coming. (laughs) Totally a thing. I would say, oh, I cannot impose on you. And you know, I've got a schedule to keep. And, all, and you would say, no, I insist. Come to my house, eat my food, and be my guest. It's going to be amazing. You know, the thing is, is that 2,000 years ago, only the, dis, uh, the, uh, the ill repute are the people who stayed in inns and, and hotels and things like that. Uh, if you... If you were a normal, everyday person, you would be invited to be in somebody's home. And if you had a friend in town, you'd just show up and knock on the door, no matter what time it is. People often traveled in the evenings and on into the night because during the summers, it was very hot during the day, and the last thing you'd want to do is travel in the middle of the day. 
So people would show up at all kinds of times, and they wouldn't call ahead. Duh. Because they can't. They don't have phones. So, bread is important. Bread is something they bake every day. We talked about this last week when we talked about what our daily bread is, because bread is baked daily. It's something that has to happen because it doesn't keep. They didn't have the little plastic bags, right? It just doesn't keep. So, They need to bake their bread daily, and if you were going to serve your guests, the last thing you would do is serve from a loaf of bread that has already been eaten on, right? It's not like it comes in these, you know, cute little slices. You want to serve them a whole meal, right? A whole piece of bread, because if it's a broken piece of bread, it looks like leftovers, right? Hey, friend, glad you're here. Um... I've got some leftover pizza, right? I can heat some up for you if you like, which is totally acceptable for me. But, I mean, normally, if you have guests at your house and you want to be hospitable, you don't serve them leftovers. And it really does take a village because everybody in the village wants to be known as hospitable. Everybody's on the team. They're going to give towards this. So everybody's going to pitch in because they want to be neighborly and they want to be known as neighborly. And people would know in their neighborhood who would have extra bread. It's a small village, right? It's a small place. Everybody knows who has extra bread. And if you need extra bread, you know where to go. Turns out it's your neighbor's house. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked and my children... And I are in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. Can't. Right? Now, if I'm in bed, that's an inconvenience to get woken up. And frank, frankly, I'd probably be a little grumpy. Probably. Right? This is a bit different. These are one-room houses. I mean, unless you had a lot of stuff, unless you were wealthy, you lived in a one-room house that had a... a, a uh, a raised platform in the middle, and it had a, a stove on it that you cooked your food on, and it also provided heat for your home. You had one door, and you had one window. So, when you put everybody to sleep, your kids and everybody are all sleeping around that stove in this small house. But it's worse, because you probably invited the, the cow and the goats in as well. After all, that's a good source of heat too. You don't want them just out there for anybody else. You want them locked up. And the only place you've got to lock them up is in your house. Well, you know that. You do that too, right? So uh, you, bring, you get everybody inside. You, you shut the door. You bar it closed and locked. And so, you're ready for everybody to go to bed. Can you imagine putting everybody in your household to bed at that point, right? Everybody in the same room, all around the one source of heat, unless, of course, you snuggle up with the cow. You don't want to get up and go looking for bread and try to figure out how to open the door in the dark. This is not where you want to be. So, everybody was sleeping on top of each other, and you groping around for some, uh, uh, for some uh, whole loaves of bread so that you can open the door and pass them out. You just don't want to do that, right? At least your neighbor doesn't. Your sleeping friend wants your visitors to eat well because they all want to be known as hospitable in your neighborhood. They just want someone else to give it, Right? You ever feel that way? That's the way they felt. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give it to give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. Anybody anybody ever had those two words used towards them? You ever been called shamelessly? Right? Oh, because of your shameless audacity. I've heard that from my mother a few times. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Right? 
because of your shameless audacity. Because persistence wins in the end. Your friend wants to go back to sleeping. And because you are willing to wake up his whole house, it doesn't matter if he gets up or not. So he will get up, not because of friendship, but because of your persistence. Turns out that is a good quality, and you will get everything you need. Prayer is the same way. Not that God is sleeping and doesn't want to get up. But Jesus says that our persistence is important in our prayer life. Once we put ourselves under God's authority the way that He taught us to, by doing what He says, by making even His name holy, because of our reflection of Him, that we do His will on earth as it is in heaven. We trust that all that's going to work out and that I'm going to eat today with me doing everything that He has asked me to do. I'm going to trust in all of that. And when I put myself under God's authority and I pray persistently, that prayer will pay off. We can move God to work in our best interest as long as it is something that He is also interested in, like our neighbor who wants our guests to be fed, right? Persistence is a good idea. So, it's our job to put this into practice. We need to put this to work. If you've ever prayed, you've probably prayed for things like for people to change or illness or somebody to get healed or somebody that's, that's on their deathbed to, to, to get better, right? Or prayed more gas in your tank to make it to the next gas station. I don't know what you pray about. Sometimes it seems important to me, and sometimes it seems like, well, this wasn't important, but it sure is right now, right? I pray about these things. I don't always, I'm not really good at the persistent part. I'd like to get better at this. I need to put it to work. This is what Jesus says. And I want you to envision this without any of the rest of the stuff that we've already talked about. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. That sounds like a blank check to me. Right? All that I have to do is seek and I'm going to find. I love that part. I wish it was just here by itself. It says, your effort is required. You're supposed to go out and find it. You're supposed to pray. You're supposed to be shameless in how you bug God. Not that you can bug God. We seek out our desires, and this journey that we are on changes us first. Watch the way this works. See, when when I pray, not all of my prayers are answered the way that I want them to be. (laughs) I know it must seem like, you know, Ron's got to get everything he asked for, right? Right? It sure does seem that way. Well, there's a couple of things I've prayed for that haven't happened. Just kidding about that part. You guys with me? So, sometimes the answer is no, sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is not yet. And all of these things are listed in a, in a specific way. The way that God speaks to me is more about Him changing who I am rather than me changing my world. Peter, when he was writing to the church, he said this, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. You ever thought maybe God's just slow? I had a guy, I had a guy uh, uh, get in touch with me this week and he said, I think God forgot about me. You think God forgot about you? Yes, He hasn't given me everything I want. Like, what are you, 25? <laughs> I mean, what, you're killing me right now. When's the last time you were in church? Well, God hasn't forgot about you. <laughs> you might have forgot about God. All right. Instead, He is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, we begin to see as we pray and as we are waiting on God and we are persistent 
that God has some things that are more important than others. I love this part. Because God has an order of importance that I need to, I need to probably catch on to, right? He tells us about his motivation. His first motivation is not my shiny stuff, right? It's not about my comfort. It's not about what I get. It's about how many people are in heaven. His, the first thing that he cares about is our eternity. Because what we have here actually isn't nearly as important as what comes after. Sometimes it's really hard. Because some of that shiny stuff looks really important. But I should probably be more concerned about the things that God is concerned about first, and that is the people around me and them being in the kingdom of God. And God is a, a good father. You know how I know this? Because I'm an excellent father. I'm, I'm amazing as a father. I'm also, I also happen to be amazing as a grandfather, and I know what grandfathers do. They're supposed to spoil their granddaughters with everything they got, right? But a good father isn't like that. A good father doesn't do that. Let's see what a good father does. Which of your fathers, if, uh, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Okay? Let's take a look at this. Good fathers give. Good fathers learn to say yes as often as possible because good fathers have good timing. They have good timing. Now, I have two daughters, and they will tell you that they both had different rules. Do you know why? They're different kids, and they needed different things from their dad. And I, I don't mean to say that I was that amazing as a father, but I worked hard at giving my kids what they needed when they needed it. Not in some kind of an order that, that I thought was good for other people, but what was good for them. And God gives to us the same way. Because a Red Rider carbon action 200 shot range model air rifle is not appropriate for every nine year old named Ralphie. Some of them should wait till they're 11. And some of them should not have anything other than squirt guns. And some of them shouldn't have squirt guns. If that is true, the opposite is also true. If your son asked for a scorpion, you shouldn't give him a scorpion. Right? And I think that sometimes in my prayer life, I have asked for a scorpion. Oh, that would be amazing, right? God, I just know that's what I need right now. I mean, I didn't name it a scorpion, but whatever it was, it wasn't good for me. And God said, no. But you don't understand. Ron, you'll shoot your eye out. I am shaped by the no's that God gives me as much as the yeses. Because as I pray about the other things in my life that I want to see God change, what is the first thing He changes? Me. He changes my heart. Until... It, the sweet spot begins to grow, right, in my prayer life. I put myself under God's authority, and I pray fervently for the things that I believe are just and righteous. And God says yes to some and no to others and not yet to some. God transforms your life and the characteristics in which you begin to look and reflect Jesus even in your prayer life. That's a pretty cool place to be. So what does Jesus think you should be praying for? Well, he's been giving us hints about what he wants to give us. So maybe if you want God to answer your prayers, you ought to pray for the things that God wants to give you. 
How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now, now we live in a, in a, in a world that is uh, it's after Pentecost when, when the Holy Spirit came in a new way for all of us. But 2,000 years ago, when Jesus said this, people truly believed that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit only came to those awesome chosen prophets. But Jesus says, I can even come to you. You're paying attention and start praying for the things that God wants for you. God's Spirit allows you to live according to His rule. You're not supposed to be able to do it on your own. If you've ever thought, well, I just can't do that, the answer is, of course you can't. You need God's Spirit within you to work in tandem with you as a team to do what God has asked you to do, to live under His authority, to do actually what God has called you to do and to live that life. This is how God changes us. Along the journey, God changes us from the inside out. The day that we say yes to Him, we become part of His kingdom. But we are here and Jesus is our King and we need to learn to say yes to the King every time He asks. You don't get into the kingdom that way, not by your actions. You are in here because Jesus died on a cross to pay the penalty for your sin, but you're here. It's your job to learn now how to live, and our prayers will change as God changes our hearts as well. Psalm says it this way, take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. I used to go, yes, Lord, I so... That's amazing. I delight in you. And I need a new car, right? I'm missing the point, right? When I do the things that God has called me to do, I do not do them grudgingly. I do them with delight. And when I do them with delight, God changes me from the inside out. And you know what He does? He gives me the things in my heart to desire so that God can give me the things that I really, really want. God gives me the things that I should desire and then gives them to me because I put myself under His authority. It's not a blank check. I don't get to tell God what to do. I'm not in charge of God. God's in charge of me. But this is how it works. And that is how you get what you want out of God. God changes you, and He changes your wants and desires to reflect Him. That's a great place to be, right? Ah, uh, but I still want my shiny stuff. Give it up. No. Yeah, well, you know. God gives you what you want. And this is what God teaches us to pray. Will you pray this again with me? Because this puts ourselves under God's authority, and I want you to make this your prayer right now. Today, tomorrow, Tuesday, and the rest of your life. Are you ready? Pray this with me right now. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God wants to do that for you today when we put ourselves under His authority. If today you are a follower of Jesus and yet you keep wondering why God doesn't answer your prayers, you think maybe God has forgotten you, you think maybe God is a spiteful God keeping the things from you that you want. You are missing the point. And you need to put yourself under God's authority today. And actually figure out how to do what He has called you to do. What He has written about in His Word. And follow. If today you're uncertain about where you'll spend eternity, you're saying, I, I don't know if I'm a follower of Jesus or not. Well, regardless of what you've called yourself in the past, today, if you are uncertain about 
where you will spend eternity right now. You can say this prayer. I'm going to say I'm going to say this prayer out loud. If you say it in your heart, God will meet you right where you're at. He will change your future. He will make you a part of His kingdom right now. And you don't have to worry about that again. Now all that you have to worry about is figuring out what it means to be a part of His kingdom. God will do that for you right now. Will you bow your head and close your eyes, just making an altar where you're at? And if you are, if you are a follower of Jesus, ask Him if you have received the desires that he wants you to have. Ask him if you are truly under his authority or if you're just playing games. If you're trying to be the leader and make God do what you want him to do. If you're getting your cookies from the gates of hell and asking God to protect you. And if you are uncertain about where you'll spend eternity... Will you say this prayer out loud as I say it? Uh, will I say it in your heart as I say it out loud? He'll meet you right where you're at and make you a part of his kingdom right now. Father God, I need you in my life to be my savior because I can't save myself. Be my king and may I figure out how to say yes to you always and be my friend go with me and show me my world through your eyes thank you for your gift of eternal life starts for me today in jesus name we pray amen